How about that, my friends? Woo! <laughs> All right, welcome to our new sermon series called Friends. Friends, 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 friends. Let us pray for our message today. Um, God, we thank you for creating this community, for the value that it brings us, for the value this community can bring Georgetown and the surrounding areas. Uh, We name and we claim that it's a gift to us. All the different ways that Just the people sitting around us help us get through life and help support us. Uh, Those in our life that that check in on us, our friends, um, we pray that through this, these conversations that we can become even a little stronger, offer more for each other that might help support uh, this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In May of last year, 2023, the Surgeon General who is Dr. Vivek Murthy. He released an 81-page document that was an advisory on a public health crisis. In the report, he said that we have an obligation to give this crisis the same investment and the same focus that we have given to tobacco use, to obesity, and to the addiction crisis. And he named this our epidemic of loneliness and isolation, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. He's upset because he's not going to lunch with us later. That's what it is, Annie. He's all right. He's all right. Um, Our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Um, You may know, and it may be obvious to you, that loneliness affects us emotionally, but loneliness also affects our mortality rates and our health. Mortality impact the mortality impact of being socially disconnected, the impact of being socially disconnected is similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness increases the risk for premature death by 26%. And poor social connection is associated with increased risk of heart disease by 29%, and stroke by 32%. Loneliness, social disconnection is also associated with increased risk for anxiety, depression, and dementia. And the data that we've been looking at is headed in the wrong direction. It's not that we're here and we're talking about where we are, but the data shows that things are getting worse year by year. Between 1990 and 2021, that's 31 years, there was a 25% decline in people who say they have five or more friends. Five or more friends declined 25%, which is quite significant. We're also seeing these things much more significantly in younger generations. So they asked people 66 and older. For people 66 and older, they're finding that 41% report being lonely. And 66 and older, 41%, while people 18 to 24 are saying 79% are reporting loneliness. 79% of people 18 to 24 reporting being lonely. These are statistics. They punch us in the gut. Um, But we also have our own anecdotal evidence and our own stories and our things. We could talk about um, phones and internet, and we could talk about... um, AirPods, and I mean, we could go on and on about all the different things, but our question for us today, friends, is what can the church say to this crisis? What hope can the church offer uh, in in this question? So that's what we're going to look at the next three weeks, is what is it that you and I can do? What is it that the church can do to speak to this epidemic of isolation and loneliness? To start with, I think we look at our theology. Our theology is our our fancy word for our relationship with God and what we think about who God is. Our basic understanding of God is that God is relational. God is relational. 
We have an understanding of a God who is three in one. You've, you've heard that before, a three in one, a trinity, a trinitarian God, a God of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes we say the creator and the redeemer and the sustainer. At the very beginning of, of the Bible in Genesis 1, it talks about the creation of humankind. And if you're reading it slowly, you might notice that it says, then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness. From the very beginning, this understanding of God is a God of a trinity, a God that is in relationship with God's self. Uh, some of us are familiar with this song, The Lord of the Dance. That's where that song comes from. It's the dance between these three, all working together in relation. God is always a community. And then next, that God is relational to us. God is relational to you, that God sent the light of the world, Jesus incarnate, to be among us. God wanted to be in relationship with you because God cares for you and God loves you. God is of God's self a community, and God wants to have a community relationship with you. So, if we are made in the image of God, then we are made to be in this similar community, in a similar relationship. We were made for each other. We were never meant to be isolated by ourselves. Genesis 2, uh, and I'm going to tweak the wording just a little bit. It says, uh, God said, it is not good that you should be alone. It's not good that you should be alone. And even if we don't feel lonely, if you personally don't feel lonely, if you think you've kind of got this all figured out, guess what? We're a church who cares for our neighbor. Um, we're a church that says if this is a problem with our neighbors, then it's a problem enough for us to speak about and to think about and offer some solutions for so the next three weeks, we're going to talk about community. We're going to talk about our need for friends. We're going to have a little bit of fun with a show that some of us watched, um, but we're really looking at something uh, quite serious and quite important. And um, we're going to look at three sets of friends in the Bible and what we might learn from their relationship. Next week, we're going to look at Naomi and Ruth. And, and in Naomi and Ruth in the Old Testament, uh, there is loyalty and there is loyalty in the middle of disagreement. There is loyalty in the middle of argument. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to have anger versus contempt in our life uh, and how that might tell us something about our friendship. And then the following week, we're going to look at Paul and Timothy. We're going to ask a question about mentorship and what it means to offer who you are to those around you and offer what you know uh, to those, not just those that are younger, but mentors in your life. Today, we're going to look at Jonathan and David, David and Jonathan from the Old Testament. So David and Jonathan, they were a very unlikely relationship. Jonathan was the firstborn of the king, Saul. Uh, Jonathan was in line. He was the crown prince. He was lined up to be the next king, while David was the last born son of a farmer. When we pick the story up here, David has just slayed Goliath. Um, he's just slayed Goliath, and he's been put in charge of all these armies, and he's finding great success. It was clear that the hand of God was on David as he was successful anywhere and everywhere that he went. Uh, and then a kind of a sarcastic line, but one of my favorite lines in the Bible is 1 Samuel 18, 7. There's um, a David and Saul are coming through town, and the, the streets are lined with adoring fans uh, as they're, they're praising them and lifting them up. And, and the line says, Saul has killed his thousands, while David his ten thousands. And, and I like that line. It's kind of like, hey, Saul, you're good. But this guy, David, man, that's really it. Um, that's kind of what they're setting up. And uh, Saul begins to get jealous of this young up-and-comer, David. And Saul gets angry, and Saul gets jealous, and Saul plans to kill David. 
And in fact, if you read through uh, 1 Samuel, there's multiple times that Saul tries to kill David. There's a couple scenes um, where they're in kind of the throne room and, uh, and David, excuse me, Saul picks up a spear and he throws it at David. And the Bible says he tries to pin him to the wall and, and he misses. And then he does it again. And then I'm reading it, I'm like, man, if everybody, anybody who throws a spear at me, I'm not going to wait for the second spear uh, to come be thrown. I'm out of here. But that's what is going on here with David. Um, so time and time again, Saul is trying to kill David, and somebody gets in the middle to save David, and that's Saul's son, Jonathan. Jonathan sees the heart of God in David and sees that they're together and they're similar. Even though they're so different, the two are so very different, they see a similar heart for God. Um, in 1 Samuel 20, it says, Jonathan loved David as he loved his own life. So in our scripture today, Jonathan is making, it says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe he was wearing and he gave it to David and his armor and his sword and his bow and his belt. And we kind of ask, what's going on here with, uh, with, with Jonathan giving all these things to David? Uh, Jonathan was the crown prince. Jonathan was in line to be the king. And by saying, look, here's my kingly robe, I'm giving this to you. Here's the sword I'm supposed to carry as the prince, and I'm giving it to you. Uh, he's saying, I am stepping back from what's been given to me, and I'm giving to you, and you're going to be the next king. He was giving up his crown for a friend. And so these two were told over and over again in the Bible, they deeply love each other. They have this brotherly love. In the Greek, uh, there's a word for that, philia. And they have this philia love. That's where Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, comes from. Um, and as Jonathan dies in 2 Samuel, David, because he's a singer, he sings this song. And it says this. It says, I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of a woman that this philia love was, was even more significant than maybe the eros love that we had, uh, uh, you might have for uh, someone. So what are we seeing in this relationship that can speak to us, that can help uh, strengthen our relationship? What I see in this as Jonathan uh, steps down and gives to David what he thinks David should have from God is selfless service. Selfless service, that Jonathan was serving David, not for his own good, but out of his shared heart for God and his love for them. That this friendship was about service, was about what the other needed, not what Jonathan was going to get out of the relationship. It wasn't a transaction. And I think back on the friends that I've had there's some friendships that we have that are transactional friendships. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna give this and you're gonna give this and I'm gonna benefit because we know each other and we're networking and we're gonna have this deal. There's a writer I was looking at, he called these uh, deal friends instead of real friends. Um, that what we really learn, yearn for in life are real friends, not deal friends. That when the deal is done, you, you're not uh, friends anymore. So service. Service is a powerful antidote to our loneliness. So those of us that struggle with loneliness, that struggle with that, um, Surgeon General says that lonely, loneliness really beats up our sense of self-worth. When we feel lonely, we don't feel like we have anything to offer to those around us, to our community. And so it's very insightful. Uh, Vivek Murthy puts this in his, in his writing. He says, instead, service reminds us that we have value to bring the world. I like that. Um, service 
is a chance for us to remind ourselves that we have value to bring to those around us. So I want you to consider the ways that you serve. Consider the ways that you serve. Uh, Some of us have formal ways that we serve. We're part of local organizations. Um, Maybe we volunteer at the caring place, and it's a kind of a formal relationship. Uh, Some of us deliver beds to local families. The confirmation class is going to be doing that. Um, Well, the youth are through D-NOW. And these are incredibly important, uh, but we also have informal ways, informal ways that we serve others. We check in on our neighbors. Um, We do the small things that remind ourselves, again, that we have value to bring to the people around us. And sometimes what's most beneficial, especially when it comes to relationships, are the very small things that happen again and again, the very small ways that we can show each other that we care for each other. I was thinking about this um, this week, something that I've started doing. I'm a neighborhood walker. Uh, I walk around in the neighborhood, um, not to get to know people. I don't want to talk. I just want to try and get something going with my heart. Um, but something I've started doing lately, and, and this isn't just to, to, to brag, it, it's, it's just hopefully it's helpful. I've started picking up screws that I see on the street. Like if I see a screw or a nail or something, I'm like, I'm going to pick that up. And, and as I'm putting it in my pocket, I'm thinking, man, I must have just helped somebody today. Like, oh, Kenny here is not going to run uh, into this screw. Or uh, Eric McKinney's not going to run into this screw because he's my neighbor. Um, and... and and maybe there's some really small things that you might do or you might be able to do that, that people wouldn't even know. No one knows unless you're preaching and you tell them in a, in a sermon. <laughs> um, <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, service really helps define who we are as Christians. Service helps define who we are as Christians because to follow Christ means that we live for others and not for ourselves. If we're going to be a Christ follower, we're going to follow that pattern and that model of Christ coming to be for us and serving us and giving of himself for us. It's our understanding about God. It's our theology that leads us and gives us a desire to serve. So think about the ways that you serve. Also, consider your friends. Consider your friends. Uh, Maybe if you were to just think about that small handful of close people around you, how have you served them lately? Have you, how have you served them lately? Or have we just been too busy that, boy, you know, it's been a while since I've even reached out to them? Um, what would a, an occasional text thread or an occasional phone call or a card or anything that just might pause our incredibly busy life uh, to offer yourself for them? Um, have you been a friend um, lately? And I think for some of us, as we get through these three messages as we look at friends, um, our goal is not to find the next five friends. Um, That may be a goal that you have, is I I just need some more people around me. I think for some of us today, it's going to be going back to those first handful of friends and saying, what can I do to strengthen these relationships? Um, How have I gotten so busy that I've let those go over the last few years? I've lost that need, that connection. I haven't really served them um, in, in a while, that maybe that's going to be the encouragement um, from, from these messages. One more quote from uh, the Surgeon General. Um, he says, each of us can start now in our own lives by strengthening our connections and our relationships. Our individual relationships are an untapped resource, a source of healing Hiding in plain sight. A source of healing, hiding in plain sight. So I want you to consider today service. What that might have to do with your relationships and those around you. Consider those first few friends. Some things that you might pick up here. It's a new year. Something that you might need to do this week to rebuild that connection that you have with them. And then today I want to close with a blessing. It's a blessing that I'm going to close with at the end of each of these messages. It's a blessing by a poet, a writer, John O'Donohue. Uh, he wrote an amazing book called Anamkara. Anamkara means spiritual friend, holy friend. And I'm going to read this for us. I'm going to just kind of let you know I'm editing the last word because the last word in this 
blessing is the word anamkara, and I'm going to change it to friends uh, to be a little bit more helpful. So just get settled for a second. Um, I'm going to read this for us, but let your eyes follow along. May you be blessed with good friends. May you learn to be a good friend to yourself. May you be able to journey to that place in your soul where there is great love and warmth, feeling, and forgiveness. May this change you. May it transfigure that which is negative, distant, or cold in you. May you be brought to the real passion, kinship, and affinity of belonging. May you treasure your friends. May you be good to them, and may you be there for them. May they bring all of the blessings, the challenges, the truth, and the light that you need for your journey. May you never be isolated. May you always be the gentle nest of belonging. Be in the gentle nest of belonging with your friends. Thanks be to God. Thank you all.